Hey, welcome back, everybody. And I know it's been a while, so I apologize, but life and work is a priority for me. And this podcast is just a hobby. So I just continue to record at, at my own pace, gradually, uh, yet professionally. So um, I apologize, but I hope you will enjoy this episode. I recorded this episode during my visit in New York with Matteo Zuretti. Matteo is the Chief of International Relations and Marketing at the MBPA office, uh, National Bas Basketball Player Association in New York. And he is responsible for all the international players. Uh, we know each other for a long time as he started off his career with an agent. He talked about that. Um, he talked about the mentorship he received, how it helped him in his current job. And we talked about the identity of players, of international players, how they find themselves, um, how he can help them, how he gains their trust, and the cultural differences, as well as some other cultural things like wine. So please enjoy this episode. Please subscribe to this channel. It was a fine episode to watch on YouTube because we're at the MBPA office in the PlayStation room, uh, very comfortable seats, and uh, it's, it was it was fun. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope you enjoyed. Please subscribe and like it, and I'll see you soon. Bye. Mateo, we can talk into this mic. We can. We can. Yeah, let's, do it. <laughs> let's do it. Thanks for having me over here at the MVP office in New York. We're here at this PlayStation ground. Um, I don't know how you want to call it. What is it like gaming station? And I wanted to ask you if you're ready to play a game with me. Let's play. Let's play. Absolutely. Lambas Ritas, welcome to... Uh, to the MBPA headquarter and yes we are here in this space it's uh, it's a content uh, studio and our gaming space um, that we have here available for the players um, this is we say it's home away from home from them so we know how passionate they are about certain things and we try to <laughs> make it feel at home yeah make it feel at home but actually as you know as, as you probably saw uh, there is basically a mini practice facility in a skyscrapers in Times Square here so court hydro room um, a gym, full equipped gym, and then a lot of office space. So a lot of the guys come through and uh, conduct their business here. So it's amazing. It's my first time here. It's my first time. And uh, I just saw, I didn't get to see the gym. I just saw the weight room, but I saw the windows go lead to the gym. I've seen players work out there before. And it truly is like a, just a home for every basketball nerd, like from A to Z. Yeah. Looks looks like it. It, it. it is. Patty, Patty actually now is getting shots up after yesterday. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh sue bird is, is working in the in the sweet in the gym so you know we have some greatness in the house and it's always fun to get out and go to the restroom and hearing a ball bouncing yeah yeah it's something it's a privilege i i love to have yeah i can imagine um but matteo we've we know each other but we don't know know each other so, so let's get to know know each other today <laughs> a little bit better and i also like we're going to talk a little bit about um uh, the business itself, because I'm a, I'm I'm a rookie. With, when it comes to that, I'm more like you know on the on the court side of it. But I'll be curious for you to educate me about it, the business side of it. Um, I'll have an introduction separately to tell people who you are uh, in in an introduction video. But I would like to for you to tell the people of like what your early beginnings were into basketball, the first steps in Italy that cause you to fall in love with it and then seek out your dreams if you had dreams if you had plans Jokic said like he just goes with the flow so I don't know if you went the same way I mean Nikola is, is way too gifted <laughs> I don't have the same gift he had <laughs> but actually as you can see like he has been working hard to 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 actually uh keep the dream alive because once you once you start living it then you have to prove everybody and yourself that um the thing is to continue right and you never can take it for granted there's the next guy ready to get your spot yes. and that's how competitive it is when you play in the nba or when you work in an nba environment just like you do um i like to think i'm the byproduct of the nba marketing machine um it's too simple i think to say that it was because of, of michael jordan as many of us have started to play yes for sure uh, but i think i got sucked in by um the vision of david stern mm -hmm and this ability to make this game global. And so I was one of the many kids in Europe who, who would go and get shots up, you know, at, at the playground or in the local local club, but also who was fascinated by these amazing athletes and by uh, how the league was packaging it, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
so that, that's how it all started. I stopped playing very early. Uh, and um, my, my former coach, uh, Germano D'Arcangeli, who is the founder and the deus ex machina of Stella Azzurra Basketball Academy, which I'm sure many of you or, or your people who follow your podcast know about, um, told me, hey, I'm restarting this dead uh, historic uh, club uh, in Rome, Stella Azzurra. You want to help me out? Uh, you know, he sent me, he paid for my coaching um, uh, course, uh, and then I started to be his assistant coach. And uh, we literally took this non-existing team, and we climbed the ladder uh, of, of the minor minor leagues in Italy. Now, now Germano coaches in second division mm-hmm. with the, with a bunch of young guys, and more importantly, we started to have a very good youth program. And yeah. that's really where I where I started to. That was my gym. Um, we were lucky enough, and that's again was Germano's vision to um, to to add at a certain point Andrea Bargnani uh, to to our club and, and and our roster, and so that really exposed me for the first time as a coach and somebody that in the meantime started to do scouting and started mm-hmm. to do recruiting um, of what it means to be that type of prospect. Uh, 16 17 years old and everything that is around it attention right? attention and and expectations and pressure and and the dynamic and the different stakeholders i was very young i was like 20 yeah so everything was new to me and you know rome is an interesting city because we are kind of the um, as rome was the center of the roman empire basketball wise we are absolutely one of the provinces <laughs> because everything happens as you know mostly in the in the northern part of yeah. italy milano yeah. bologna varese Cantù, you know all, the, all the, that area venezia now treviso at that time who actually then what came and recruited andrea um where andrea started his career and so that was for sure a very interesting experience to me i understood pretty soon that i was not about x's and o's uh, and that i was more fascinated by the player um, development side of things mm-hmm. or the, the, the talent. Um, and that is um, the time when I met uh, the other significant person in my life who's, uh, who was Maurizio Balducci, mm-hmm. one of the godfathers of the agent business in Europe. Yep. And one of the first ones um, who understood that it was not about Italy, but it was about Europe and that the Bosman rule actually allowed to build a global a global agency for so um i met uh, i met maurizio actually through a colleague of yours even if yours for another franchise stefan lupatelli yep. um and maurizio and stefan were fantastic they really gave me access again i was 24 i didn't know anything about it um and at that time pro talent had some pretty interesting players uh at that time when i started uh, we were representing uh, Sharas, who I know you just had on your podcast, or Sani Beshirovic. Uh, and then there were uh, Basile and Lorbeck, young Lorbeck, and then a bunch of, uh, uh, I would say, sleepers or late bloomers that Maurizio, through, I think, his um, uh, ma- m- managing skills, highly contributed in making the Champions they became. I think about Shishka, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and as you know, Maurizio had very strong ties in Lithuania. Everything started with uh, a colleague, uh, colleague of yours on the bench side, <laughs> uh, Um And so to me, it was a dream, right? Like I was a kid. I was starting to travel around Europe. Uh, we, were, we had players from 20 different countries and really learning this global, this global environment. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that really was my, again, my gym in learning um, that everybody reacts to different stimuli. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, and from players. I mean, players from a player perspective, mm-hmm. but I think in general, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, imagine imagine if, you're negoci- if you're an Italian agent negotiating a contract with Maccabi Tel Aviv for a Lithuanian player. Mm-hmm. How many... Uh, cultures and identities are, are involved difficult. into that. Right? Very difficult. And at that time, now, now it's more normal because of the work that has been done all these years to, to unify Europe. And it's sad to say that uh, in these hours, as, as yes. we see the crisis in Ukraine, but um, Europe became, I think, much more cohesive. Uh, cohesive. And uh, but when, when I started, Maurizio was really one of, uh, 
uh, of of um, of the trailblazers of this ability to relate to people from so many different countries and identities. And I think that was key for me to then um, land this job eventually mm -hmm. uh, here at the PA. Um, because uh, after doing a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, 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 entry level stuff, and actually there's one I want to share absolutely with you because I think it, it speaks to so much about Mauricio vision. After doing all of this work, I started also to recruit and to, to negotiate contracts for players. And then I had this opportunity to join here in the MVPA. Um, but I got to share this with you because I, I always, thinking about it now, I find it fascinating. So the first thing that Maurizio, Maurizio asked me to do, uh, I go to Perugia, uh, where we had our headquarter, and he goes, okay, Matteo, so you're going to start with us. Um, you're going to help Stefano. You're going to help me. I want you to be involved in everything. He put, put phone on speaker all the time from day one. I was like in these crazy negotiations, listening from day one. So I'm so thankful to him. But the first thing he, he did is, okay, come with me. We jump on his car and we go to this uh, technological um, store, right? The computer store. Mm -hmm. And he goes- What and, year was it? Uh, this was- I Just was, because I mean, technology changes fast. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was 20, I was 20, uh, yeah, it was 2004. Okay. It was 2004. And uh, Maurizio goes to this guy and walk and says, give me the best handy cam you have. At that time there was handy cam with- yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Give me the best handy cam you have. He buy, he pays for the handicap, he gives it to me. It says, This is your this is your first assignment. Next week you go to Barcelona and uh, you you go and you shoot some content, which at that time it was not even content because yeah. that word didn't exist. But this is <laughs> tells you how poor thinking it was. You go and you shoot some 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 footage of Lou Bosch Barton, who at that time was thought was playing for Badalona, and of Gianluca Basile was playing for um for Barcelona at that time, I believe. I don't want to mess dates, but it should be should be accurate. And uh and then you come back and then you edit this stuff and you mix it with highlights because I'm sick of sending just you know great plays of my players. I want those GMs to understand who's the man behind the player. And this is gonna be our new strategy as a, as a company. We're gonna explain um the human behind the player. And this was 2004. This was content before content. Wow. Existed. So he was like, he was making you shoot inter like, interviews, talk to them and get them to know their personality, put it on tape and put it together with highlights and like just sell it the person and the player. I would go to with, with the players to pick up their kids while they were cooking, while wow. they were with their wives, go to the grocery store, regular life stuff. Wow, that's unheard of 2004. I mean, that was even before social media. That was that, that was, was before everything. That's well, no, they had MySpace at that time, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but again, um, it was a long-winded way just to, to, to explain you. And that was step one of how lucky I was to find the maestro uh, in Maurizio, who gave me full access, who gave me great opportunities. I miss him a lot. And uh, I think the sports, uh, basketball and Europe in general, and the US, given the work he has done lately, misses him a lot uh superior mind absolutely i mean i've i've got the chance to hang out with him as well just because of the lithuanian connections and the meetings we had and random meetings random dinners and um yeah i didn't get to know him as, as well as you did and these kind of stories kind of help to shed some light on on his impact in the basketball world in general like the division the division he had but in 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 terms of agency and being an agent um it, there is a lot of talk in, you know, in Europe, especially of how difficult that job is, you know, how many, how many nuances there are behind the scenes that nobody really knows. And did you experience any of that? And if you did, there were struggles that were just kind of unethical things that you saw happening. How did you not let it impact your personality and your, 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 your ethical, comp your ethical compass? Yes. Yeah. Uh, first of all, since I started to when I stopped being an agent, uh, which was 2015, um, the profession has changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons why I picked up this opportunity here, besides coming to America and, of course, work for the best players in the world, was also because that stigma associated with the agents was starting to, you know, be a weight on my shoulders a little bit too much. Yeah. Because regardless of how you interpret your job, you are an agent, people 
Exactly. Look at you like, okay, you are going to screw me. Exactly. They put you in a category right away. Absolutely. And it's a stereotype. I'm sure there's plenty, plenty of agents who who, um, uh, deserve um, this as in every profession, coaching from a player perspective or from business side of things. Um, But I think, I think it's unfair because I think the role of the agent um, is very much associated with even the financial costs associated with it. But for example, we always tend to underestimate who's the first call when things don't work. Mm-hmm. Who's the club calling when mm-hmm. the things don't work and you have a guaranteed contract with a player? Who's the first call received by? Mm-hmm. It's an agent. Mm-hmm. The agent needs either to find a solution and re- reset, reshuffle the cards with the player or needs to find a solution. And make a transaction, find a new team. This is always underestimated. It's always about, oh, the agent is asking me this and that or creating me problems, complaining. Um, I think the agents are a very important um, component of our, of our world. Mm-hmm. There are unethical things, like again, like in everything, but um, I think from my experience, most of them do, do the things in the right way and are really a key component in the development of the players. Um, and again, I go back to Maurizio, he, he would always say like, you know, that, that, and he was a master in this, he had a toolbox at the certain point, the player crashes, the player is stuck, the player and the agent is inside enough, but outside enough of the daily life of a player to be able to step in and reset. Yeah use the toolbox that use a different tool for every player because every player is different exactly. to actually reset the situation and make things click and go in a new direction. Inevitably, and there's not one, one component that is more important than the other, but inevitably, if you're a coach, your voice is heard every day from that player at a certain point. In that, one ear, out the other. That, that's exactly right. And sometimes the, the, the GM or the sports director step in and they have an important, and at a certain point you need somebody that also the player feels is, is looking at things uh, through, through his own lens and as an invested interest, right? Yeah. So um, I was lucky, Ben. Uh, I, I work for Maurizio, I work with Stefano, uh, phenomenal people um, who always were thriving to, um, do the best interest of their clients, but doing it the right way. So I was exposed to, I think, the best part of the job. Uh, lately, the competition has made it, I think, harder for for anybody who does that work to 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 keep certain um, values um, intact. Uh, but again, there's good and bad people as in every profession. I think I think we're both lucky in that regard that we got to work with the right people with good people early on in our careers and that kind of lays the the groundwork for your career and you then you automatically can differentiate right from wrong if you go into the wrong environment early on with unethical people it it kind of it sets you off the wrong foot right and then you kind of you have a hard time veering into the right direction although you probably know what the right thing to do is but you only know one way uh, because of your mentors, and we had good mentors, I think, early on in our careers. I believe, no, no question, I, know, I don't think, but I know. Who was your mentor? Uh, I had several. I mean, Kozlowskis was the first one, uh, and uh, he was very strict, very straight to the point. He was a former teacher who immediately pointed out all my mistakes in red lines without <laughs> any kind of <laughs> disregard to anything. He was testing me, but I passed the test, obviously, early on. It was tough, but he, um, he was the one who, who, uh, who laid me, put me in line. And Sferopoulos was the assistant coach who also corrected me in regards because as a, as a scout or assistant, you communicate more with the assistant coach. And he was the one who was kind of my big brother who was setting me aside of like, look, scout reports need to be ready by then, not a day before, but three days before when we start preparing for the games and certain things like, like small details around also politics. And then Messina came, you know, Messina came afterwards and Messina was the one who was completely different in, a, in, in, in regards of making you think a certain way. And that also helped me, uh, it helped, and it kind of hurt me also because it kind of transferred to my personal life as well, where I question everything and the why is the biggest question. Not only what you do on the court, 
why you do the pass, why you do the dribble, but also it comes on, on off the floor. Why am I going? Why am I going there? Why am I going to this bar? Why am I going there? Why, what, what's the what's the purpose behind everything? And and Etera is the one who taught me to think critically in a in a very very uh, deep manner, and I think that helped me to really to to also be where I'm at uh, with 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 all the flaws that I personally have because of 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 my deep thinking. Because sometimes you think a little bit too deep and you hurt your your own your own um, daily life. But I think in the long run, uh, I live with more purpose than, than I did before. Before I was too naive to, to really understand of what's going on. But that, that, but that thing, that, that's something I want to talk to you about as well, is the spectrum of people. Because throughout our careers, we met a lot of people, whether it's mentors or different uh, international players uh, from different countries. Like you said, you were expanding globally as an agency. But uh, to start transferring to your current job, how did that experience of different spectrum of people learning different cultures helps you in your current profession right now at the MBPA? Because you deal with all international players from all different countries with different mentalities, different cultures, different backgrounds, and you know every every culture you know better than than uh, than anybody else probably than how different cultures tick. You know certain things get interpreted a certain way in a different country because the language barrier is still another thing that gets it gets somehow transferred um, you have to translate the message the right way so how does that help you in the, uh, today's job i think it's it's why i have this job honestly <laughs> so um very thankful for being able to to be exposed to people from so many different cultures and I add one, one layer that we tend to underestimate, in particular in Europe, Benas, because I think there is this tendency of you're young, and so I have to keep you down there. Mm. When that happens makes a difference. Yes. Because if you are not exposed to the right thing in your very early stage, you pick up those uh, wrong um, uh, messages or you're, you're just not ready uh, you know, to, to, to contribute. So uh, what I've shared until now, like I was exposed very young, at a very, very young age to people who allow me to have all of these experiences and to have it at, in international scale. And now I'm able um, to, to translate it to my current situation. Uh, we have currently players from 39 different countries, but it's even more complicated than that because as an industry, we tend to give our guys a flag mm -hmm. because they have to carry that flag. They have to be the flag barrier of that specific market mm -hmm. because that means that the business of basketball is going to work better mm -hmm. thanks to them or it's going to thrive thanks to them in that specific market. So let's talk about somebody who we both know pretty well. So it's clear that if I look at Domanta Sabonis, I see a big Lithuanian flag. But the reality is that Domas grew up in Spain and in a specific area of Spain, in southern part of Spain, with Baltic's Lithuanian parents, experiencing Lithuanian probably every summer, going with playing with national team and feeling inevitably highly connected to it. And then not when he was 50, when he was 19, he came to play basketball in the US. Forget that he was also born in the U.S., yes. but he was too little, right? But when he was 19, he came to play in the U.S. and he played college at Gonzaga and now has been here and he's married to an American woman. What is Domas' identity? It's much more complicated than just giving him a Lithuanian flag because he has experienced so much globally that I think his personality and what he's accustomed to... Um, you know, it's the result of all these experiences. If I look at you, I see a Lithuanian guy, a German guy, somebody who has been around, uh, American players. You, start, you you play college in the US yeah, too, right? Yeah. So that's a very good topic. When you me. are 25 years old, you have been exposed to so much. And clearly you have attachment to Germany, to Lithuania, to your, your, your US, but your identity is more complex than that. People yes. talk about Yanis and claim him he's, 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 he's Greek, he's Nigerian. He's, he's again, he's, he was 18 and he moved to the US. He's the result of all these experiences. So what my early exposure to multiculturalism taught me 
is that I have to go beyond the flag that we put underneath a player or this affiliation with a specific country, but I need to understand his personal story to understand his identity. Only after that, I will be able to actually understand the endless nuances of his personality. That's uh, it's the perfect topic for me that I talk to my close friends a lot about because of that, specifically this problem exists in my life too, because I question my identity as well a lot of times, or you know, people, because I worked for a national team for such a long time in eight years, you automatically have the affiliation with the, with Lithuania. But growing up in Germany when I was six, basically from this time I was six, and then going when I was 17, going to the U.S. for five more years, it's a completely different. There's like, luckily, my luckily, I can say my parents spoke Lithuanian at home. I know people who left Lithuania and they were speaking, uh, start speaking after one year, two years, start speaking, forget the language. And so that helped me to, to, to get a little bit of a taste of, of Lithuania also because of summers, like, like Domantos also experienced Lithuania in the summers. But it, it, in generally speaking, the relationship uh, between Domas and me as well is, and, and the, 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 the common background, you feel better, better understood in, in the culture that you got formed, especially during that time, you said like 17 through 22, high school, college. That is a crucial time of your life. And when I was formed there, it makes me it makes it difficult to relate then to like, when you go back to your country where you were born at with people from Lithuania, because it was just a completely different upbringing, a completely different, especially in the 90s and 2000s. Like, I mean, you you're li they were living a different life. Than yeah. me. So that makes you feel different in certain regards. And I think your job is also to identify what makes them differently, what makes them different from 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 other people in their country and what is their personality, well, how to which buttons you have to click, which buttons you have to find, and how to connect with people. That's what, in my, for my upbringing, it helps me in my job because I can connect to different people from different cultures all around the world because you automatically identify the algorithm. I call it the algorithm of the person. And then you, you feel, you know, like Spanglish, you go to Spain, you speak, speak a little bit of Spanish, English, and you start connecting with the person not by speaking fluent English and telling them how to speak, how fluent you are in English, but you have to kind of speak with in the terms of that that country for him to understand you where you're coming from yeah phrase wise not like country wise but where you're coming from what you mean and i think in your job is specific especially difficult to 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 uh that's probably the biggest challenge to deal with yeah it's uh yeah i'm not sure I, i'm not sure i would define it a challenge I, it's it's the fun it's, it's it's the part i enjoy the most for sure yeah uh, because I'm a very curious person and uh, I love to learn more about people. People is really what I'm passionate about. That's why I love New York City. Like you go on the subway yeah. train and ooh. And I see it when I come back from, from Italy, right? Like when I go back to Italy, I, I, I love it. Like I see my identity reflected into the people around me. And then I come back here and I start to see all of these different multitudes of people. I say, damn, that's why I love New York. Yeah. And that gives me so much energy. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think I think I, I look at that more than the challenge. It's a, real, it's a true blessing because I feel I'm so aligned and and so interested in uh, in finding those buttons you you were referencing to. What what are the daily challenges that players deal with when they come here and adjusting to the U.S. culture? What do you find yourself like resolving or solving on the not maybe probably not on a daily basis, but like on the on the given season, the first season, the rookie season, I imagine is the most challenging one, just understanding the the different culture, but also everything that comes with it. Yeah, that's interesting. Um my strategy and with my team is really to create an opportunity of engagement before the guys come to the mm. to the league. Because when they're drafted, and you know this, because you are a piece of this component. A component of this of this uh, this circus, right? They arrive, they're drafted, they are in they are in heaven, they're living their dream, and they see this army of people around them. Think think mm -hmm. only from a play from a team perspective, how many people are there that are going to approach you and tell you, let me know how can I help you? How can I help you? Yeah. Oh, you're international. Here's Benas. Benas uh, is going to help you with this. Oh, you are you need a house? Okay. Then there is their personal team. Then there is their family. Then there is the league office. Then there is the MBPA. Then there is overstimulation. I mean, like from all. At a certain point, it happens all the time. The guys say, "Thank you all. 
Thank you, everybody. Can I please have a basketball? Because that's why I'm here. And by the way, I have to prove myself and everybody around, around me. And by the way, if I'm an international player, everybody back home that sees me as the flag barrier, so I have that extra pressure, I have to prove that I belong. I have to prove that, you know, this, this name behind this jersey, uh, this, this locker, uh, I earned. I, have mm. to, I still have to earn it. And so that, I think, is a moment that we want to kind of leave the guys on their own. Uh, not, not on their own, uh, by themselves, figuring this out. Mm -hmm. Which that doesn't mean that we're not there to help, their, to help them or we work closely with their agents who we certify. We work closely with their gatekeepers, their managers, who we support, with their families. But there is a pre-draft, and that's where we want to make sure the guys know who we are and what our role is. Then there is the draft and the period of time that we're there to support, but we're not over adding more stimula stimulation because they're focused on the game. Mm -hmm. And then there is, after one year, two years, a moment when the guys start to raise their head. And actually, my theory is that in, in an NBA player career, there are fundamental uh, milestones that are connected with their contract. Because within your first contract, you are, your head is down and you have to prove yourself. Then you sign your second deal. In theory, you're set up for life, right? Mm -hmm. If you manage your money correctly. That's when the guys raise their head and say, oh, okay. Oh, Matteo. Yes, I remember. I met you in uh, L'Hospitalet once and then at the Hoop Summit. And then you were at the draft. And then I saw you in a couple of meetings. Okay, let me really understand what you can do for me now that my head is up. Yeah. Before it was down to just. Yeah. And so the guys start to explore what's possible and how they can use their resources. And then there is the third contract. And at that point in particular, if you are a high profile player, you need something else outside of basketball. Mm -hmm. You need to have a, an outlet that can somehow take you away from your daily routine. Because by that time, it's already 15 years you have been yeah, you know, bouncing, bouncing. <laughs> bouncing the ball and shooting and having somebody yelling at you and tell you what to do on the court. You need, you need a different outlet and you want to start to put yourself in the best position to, to not be completely identified only with your player identity. Yeah, you're coming out of a cocoon, basically. Um, like you, you're learning too that there's way much more to life than just that. But up, up, until a certain point, there's only that and there should be only that because that's when you build your career. That's when you put your head down and work and, and, yeah. and try to establish yourself. But at a certain point, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure that it also comes with a lot of questioning themselves, the questioning identity again, questioning like what's because you're also approaching your end of the career at some point. Right. So you start thinking about what's next and that can throw you off a little bit in, in your game. So the, do players come and approach you about about the next steps afterwards? Is All that the something? time? Mm -hmm. And we are also proactive with this. We have a series of programs as MBPA where we actually provide uh, tools for them to start to figure it out. We have, a pro we have programs that actually plan to seed early in their career so that they can start to take advantage of the access they have. Mm -hmm. Because let's be fair, let's be sincere here. When you're playing, you go to a guy courtside and he, he wants to talk to you. And maybe he's a billionaire you can do business with. When you play and you pick up the phone, everybody's going to answer that phone. When you're done, you're done. Five hours after you're done, <laughs> you're done. Yeah. Nobody's going to pick up that phone unless you have not built yourself credibility and expertise and network that actually allows you to pick up of, you know, all the work you've done before. Mm -hmm. So the point is, since we're talking about identity, is how do you create an alternative identity of your player identity? You cannot be only a player. Mm -hmm. And you said, you said something that I want to challenge, in particular, for us coming from Europe, we have that mentality um, that I think is obsolete, which is you have to do only that. So, so many, going back to the agent, the agent conversation, mm -hmm. so many stakeholders go to players and say, you focus on the game. I'll do everything else for you. I think that's the biggest, the biggest virus we install into the minds of our players. I think the message should be different, should be you dedicate as much effort as you can to the game. And you take care of your life as much as your dedication to the game allows you to. 
not that I'm taking off the table responsibilities for you to take care of your life. And when I say life, I mean your life as a human being, paying your bills, uh, booking your flight, planning your vacation. Very good. Very yeah. Uh, I think I think we do a disservice to the players. I think they should focus on the game and focus on their life simultaneously because it's going to be an outlet, because it's going to prepare them for the next phase of their, their life, and because we are not only what we do. We're not only our job. Age is a, is, is a factor. I think at, at a certain age, at, at, at a certain age, you start understanding the importance of it. But while you're young, I think that it's easily to drift off into the wrong direction when you when you when you get it, it's a personality thing. There's you can't tell that to everybody because oh, okay, then start exploring and then you just go it just the horizon widens too early and you lose the focus on the main thing. Because I keep keeping the main thing the main thing. That's the that's that's the that's yeah, the, but Dennis, you know, like I have I have 24 hours in a day, right? Then I have to choose how I spend my five hours of my free time. I'm at 24. I spend three hours play play 2K here or play FIFA or play Call of Duty or I can spend two hours playing Call of Duty and one hour taking care of my life, uh, doing something that is uncomfortable and I have to go out of my cocoon and be a normal person. Um, I have to read a book. I have to, to, to give my brain uh, food. Yeah, you know? I, I I get it. I get it. I mean, I lo I love this discussion because it's I can speak from my own experience because I had a similar similar experience when I came to the states when I was seventeen, and that's why it's so nuanced. And I love the nuances because everybody's reaction is different to that. And I I came and I was seventeen, and my high school coach said like, oh, there's not mandatory practice this weekend, like well, early on in the season, but but preseason. Um, guys can come in and shoot if they want to shoot. I mean, there's not necessarily to come. I was much my first time in the U.S. since I was because I came I came to the U.S. when I was six, also go to 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 uh, elementary school, and then 17 to high school, and I was like, oh, okay, it's not mandatory, fine. So, and I was used to I was used to um, practicing in Germany like with different groups, like it was not as intense in as, less, as in the states, let's say. And then I was like, oh, so we off, off weekend, all right, so. I was running with my host brother. We were driving go-karts around the neighborhood. They had like a bunch of go-karts. We had some fun, went to the mall. And, and then Monday's like, oh no, was, he called, he called. He's like, Where you at? Uh, it's free weekend, I'm, I'm, I'm go-kart. And, so, and then he called me in the office on, 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 on Monday. He said, look, in the US, there's so many distractions. And if you just, you came here to play as a foreigner and I know it's not mandatory, but there's only way that you can get to the next level is by dedicating your time now to this. It kind of left a mark and it was 17. So it's kind of it planted the seed for the for later on. Then fast forward when I came to Moscow out of nowhere. And when it was a call, and, and I don't like to talk too much about myself here on the podcast, but I, keep, I don't want to repeat myself. But there was nothing else for me. It was like do or die for me. And in, in that because I felt like it was luckily I felt it was a chance of a lifetime and I had to dedicate everything to that so i didn't sleep barely slept i was i didn't have any friends i didn't have anything i was just in the office in the gym and and came home just to sleep came back and that got me where i'm at today and then i started to experience like okay and it's not the sense that oh i'm relaxing now i just felt like i learned to balance it a little bit better that's than the before. Point. That's a, i think i think but it's an age thing it's age i thing. think i think you touched on the most important thing so as we all work in different capacities in developing players, I think we should spend more time discussing or identifying how we can help them manage their time. Because what, what you did that day at 17 was to not go to a two hours non-mandatory practice. I'm not saying you shouldn't be gone. I'm saying go. But once you went and, and went two hours to, to a non-mandatory practice, you have 22 more hours. And what are you going to do with those 22 hours? It's going to make a difference in what type of human being you're going to become. And I think we are very much focused on those two hours and not on the other 22 hours. And I think since we talked about mentors, a coach, uh, uh, um, you know, a manager of a club at that age for a kid who was 16, 17, 21, needs to take that into account as well. 
it's not only the two hours you give me 100 percent, then you can spend 22 hours playing playing video games it's like how do i create the conditions for you to own your life Mm -hmm. And in particularly in this MBA ecosystem, when there are a lot of resources, and we are part of that, okay? Um, so I'm not blaming anybody. I'm blaming this, the, 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 the system itself. Is with all these resources, we have the tendency to take problems away from guys. But sometimes you need to deal with problems to, to flourish and to blossom. And look, everybody admire MBA players for what they do on the court. I admire them even more now that I'm daily conversation with them because of what they do off the court on how sophisticated they are. And each one of them who are sophisticated are the ones who at a certain point decided to put their hands on their life and own it and build a team and direct a team. And you are able to do that at 25, 23, 26, only if before you started to train your the right muscle of your brain to make it happen. For sure, that you have to start building at some point different tools in your box. You have to you have to develop them, and it's on the people around that player to recognize what they need the most and what they need what they need more and what they need less of. Uh, and not everybody's able to recognize that, and not everybody has the right people around them. So I think I can imagine that it's also, uh, or maybe like I should ask you that maybe how 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 do you control can you control the environment of the of the person and uh, of the player and help them to make a, maybe a better decision of putting the right people around them and maybe eliminating the wrong people or out of their life when you see that there's a bad influence in their life? That, that is all up to the type of relationship you are able to build with the, with the, with the player. Uh, the player, the players rightfully so build a wall. Mm -hmm. When they arrive, you know, the army of people, they build a wall. Mm -hmm. It's a trust wall. Mm -hmm. They have a big target on their back and they're there and they're waiting for you to fail, mm -hmm. right? To fail mm -hmm. their trust. If you are able to keep going and to build it and to tear down that wall, then you have their ear, uh, which doesn't mean influence them. It means that now they're listening. Before they were playing a game, the game behind the game. Hello, how are you doing? My man, what's up? That's the game behind the game. Yeah. Then there is real conversations. And when if you have the right trust, uh, from the players, the right amount of trust, you're going to be able to um, shine a light on, on certain part of their life that might not be working, or they are the ones coming and say, look, this is the issue I have. What do you think? How, what can I do? Uh, very practically, we have different expertise in-house. We provide players. These are the 10 questions you should ask your financial advisor. So don't just go into the room and say, okay, let, where do I need to sign? Mm -hmm. And you go out, own it ask questions, learn, because it's your money, it's your future, it's your family future, it's your generational wealth. And that applies to financial advisors, that applies to agents, that applies to medical staff, trainers and, and coaches. We, we, we do not have a magic stick that, and, and say, hey, these are the magical things you can do to make your life go better. But if we do have the right relationship with, with, with the players, organically this opportunity comes and we what i always say in particular to families when we start to talk in this journey we embark in this journey what is going to happen to your son has already happened to somebody probably we already helped that person already in the past the player of that family so we have a humongous amount of experience because the, the issues and the challenges are often very similar so let me let me rewind a little bit and dig into into your experience specifically not necessarily the player's experience but mm -hmm. Because I've learned from my mistakes early on, especially as I said, like Kozlowskis was correcting every little thing. And, and also with Messina, there was mistakes that I did that I learned from. And it's not it learned, like I was obliged not to make the same mistake again. That's basically it. But I would like to hear if you have made a mistake where, where you talk about coach uh, players trust and they're waiting for you to fail. Have you gotten yourself into a situation and you don't have to go into many specifics, but what, like was there a situation where you have felt like I made a mistake and you had to go back and correct it or did it work itself out automatically? All the time that I haven't followed through, if all the time, and I like to think it didn't happen that often uh, because I learned where I um, overpromise and underachieve mm -hmm. or simply underachieve. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm always very cautious and this is what I share with my team 
let's under promise and overachieve all the time. Mm. Let's not tell them we are able to do something we're not able to. Let's not be um, selfish because we want to take the credit for something we are not able to deliver. Mm -hmm. Let's instead direct the person to the right resource because it's not about um, who takes the credit. It's about solving an issue for a player, mm -hmm. helping a player figuring out the situation. It doesn't matter who that comes from. I go back to the NBA, abundance of resources. Can the league office do something for these guys? We are the ones to say, you should talk to the league about this. Have you, did you check that? They are doing an amazing job into this. You should talk to the international team, to Kim Bahuni. Uh, we, should, we should have a podcast about her one day. <laughs> She's a phenomenal, phenomenal, um, phenomenal figure that really made even my job possible. Mm -hmm. um, or you should talk to, you know, player marketing group at the NBA or player development group. Because they can do this better. Immigration. There is this person that is a phenomenal resource for the guys. Travis Murphy worked for the league. Uh, we, we have very big um, collaboration with him, right? So it's not about who takes the credit. Who cares? Mm -hmm. it's, it's about um, fixing the issue. So to me, the, 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 the problem and the mistake is always where you're not able to follow through mm -hmm. on a promise you're paid. And uh, we are really careful about that. I, I, I like to think we don't do it that very often. Mm -hmm. Well, it's experience again. You're like, you, you, you figure it as you go and you, you, you feel it inside more than anybody else. So, and that's, that's when the gut decisions also come into place where you feel like, uh, I need to check, double check on this, this, these things. So I think with it, the more experience you have, the more you can differentiate where, where you probably can add to the delivery. But talking about the global business, because I, for me as a rookie off the court, in terms of business, I have not, have not, I don't have much association with it. Can you explain of how the global business can continue to ex extend and expand in terms of NBA? Because I'm not sure. I was wondering if you were also 99 in, in Milan at the McDonald's games. Uh, I was not. I was, I was there. That was one of my first NBA experiences that I had. Uh, my parent, my my father took me there. But that's also, like you said, like that MBA is good at, at, at really planting the seed. But how is everything intertwined in turn, and globally uh, from the MBA's aspect? And how, how, does, how do, does the MBA continue to expand into, into other regions of the world that maybe people haven't heard of? Yeah, so about that, we got to give huge credit to the league office. Uh, first, David Stern and his vision. Uh, if, if, if you guys Google it, there is... Uh, this incredible picture of David Stern with the with mustache, and behind him there is this sign that says China Games 1984, <laughs> sponsored by Guinness, the, the Irish <laughs> beer. It's like I mean that, that I, I think that's a manifesto of, of of David Stern's vision. So we owe him everything about that. People like him, but who we just mentioned, who actually was the the you know. The operational arm with her and their team and the people who work with her in these years. Um, and of course now um, Adam and, and Mark Tatum are, are carrying that, that torch forward. But there is this there is this line which I love and it's very simple, it's so intuitive. The goal of the league, also through the partnership uh, they have with FIBA, is to convince one more kid to bounce a ball instead of kicking a ball mm -hmm. globally, right? And everything starts there. And they do an amazing job. They do an amazing job doing so. Junior MBA, now there is all the work they're doing, their academy <coughs> uh, system, BWB, um, and, and, and this pyramid that they've built um, where the growth of the game really fuels the growth of the business. <laughs> and then they need something that add that magical, magical touch to it. And only players can bring that. Mm -hmm. um, the league has created the conditions and the guys have been phenomenal in empowering um, this, this, this process globally through being aware of their, of, of their role, right? Um, giving back, um, playing with their national team, maybe sacrificing some time, um, dedicating time to learning the, the, 
the, the business of basketball uh, and being ambassadors of the business of basketball in their own countries or in their own continent. Uh, the players are are clearly the engine, and I'm biased on this. Mm -hmm. uh, the league created the conditions, but the players is the ones who have who have really elevated uh, the opportunities. Uh, and in fact, desperately, uh, we are waiting for the next talents to come from Asia, which is of course so important uh, in in the ecosystem and in the in the business ecosystem for for our sport. Um, in Africa, great things are happening. Uh, BAL being, I think, a piece of a much bigger operation mm -hmm. that the league has been able to put together on the business side, on the grassroots side before. Um, thanks to the work um, of Amadou Galoufal, um and, um, and, and of Mazai and other folks. Uh, the league is the global league. Mm -hmm. uh, the NBA is the global league, and uh, that means that it's, that we are a global business. I think. I think the key, though, everything starts from how do we convince a kid to to bounce the ball instead of kicking the ball, just like they do. They say at the Olympic Tower, because that kid will be the next Joel Embiid or the next consumer of mm -hmm. a jersey, a league pass, um, or a hat, or uh, the chief of marketing and <laughs> international and marketing at NPPA. <laughs> I, I, I kind of feel I'm the, I, I said at the beginning, byproduct of that. Um, we all are. Yeah, of we, course. We are, we of course. Are man, we all live. We, we all are here. And we, I, I was waking up at three o'clock in the morning watching NBA games live because there was only one one night in a, a, a week that was streamed that was shown on TV in Germany. So I, that was, I mean, we all live through our stories of how NBA influenced us. And um, it's, it will continue because of the wide spanning um, world of like internet and, and how it's interconnected. It's going to continue to, to expand. But before we go into, I want to talk to you a little bit about the calendar because of, because of all this as well. It's important uh, how to balance the calendar, especially with national teams and um, the yearly calendar. Maybe you have an opinion on that. Um, but before that, what was your experience uh, from experience in the sports culture in, in Europe and experience in sports culture in the US? Because <clears throat> to me, I, the, the, the simplest example I can give is the weight rooms in the hotels. And when you come in, you're in, in the US, uh, I come in with jet lag usually to, to either East, uh, East, East Coast or Las Vegas, even worse. And you wake up early at five or six o'clock in the morning, you go to work out and it's already full at six o'clock or seven o'clock in the morning, it's full of people already working out with a very, very nice weight room. You go to Europe, first of all, you're gonna struggle to find a nice weight room in any hotel, unless you go to a nice Hilton brand or, or Marriott nice, but at every other hotel uh, is gonna be like some storage room that just has to, has to stay that has a hotel and uh, they have a weight room and it's gonna be empty for sure because it's just nobody wants to work out there. So what was your, uh, like the, the experience and the differences you see when you came over here of how um, empowering and how the opportunities are presented to, to the people, to the young um, players in this, in, in this. We had a short time out. <laughs> Zoom, Zoom shut What down. is our ATO? Uh, ATO. Uh, I have the ATOs later. I have eight of them. Okay. More or less. Uh, six of them. Okay. Um, but let me open this just so people here. It's not a beer. <laughs> it's water. We should, we should go with we should go with beer next uh, time, next wine, time. wine 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 yeah. what's your favorite wine uh savion blanc from new zealand okay yeah i, I know my wines by now Matteo. Yeah. well we haven't spent enough time lately we're yeah, gonna have to yeah, go out yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but to follow up on the uh, sports culture yes um, so us versus europe go yeah um it's too simplistic the way I think we're so judgmental from Europe looking at the sports culture in the US. Like we even elevate it because we appreciate the fact that fans can go and enjoy a game, you know, wearing the opposite team jersey and, and still enjoy it. While we know in Europe we have some issues with that or some problems associated with the type of behavior. Um, and at the same time, we're so judgmental for, for, it's a show, right? In particular, when we talk about the NBA and basketball, I yeah. think you know. I think I think I go back to the identity piece, man. Like we have to decide what we want to be, and I think in the US they've decided what they want to be. Um, 
sports is a business, sports is entertainment, and sports is a product of a much bigger machine that is led just like a corporation. If I think about the NBA, mm -hmm. right? Like basketball is for the NBA what the iPhone is for Apple. You cannot just, you know, mm -hmm. think that Apple is the iPhone. Apple is a corporation and the humongous machine behind it. Mm -hmm. And so is basketball to the NBA. Uh, it's a product. Mm -hmm. uh, in, I think in Europe, we, we are struggling with, with our own identity because we do want to give ourselves better chances to be sustainable in what we do, but we are not ready to... Um, I don't want to say compromise, but to choose that certain things we need to change. Mm -hmm. um, stuck in our ways. We are stuck. We are stuck in our ways for sure. We are. Uh, we have to be braver, even because right now the polarization of our world, where only the elite properties across the board, not only sports, only the elite of the elite get the eyeballs and the attention, and so the financial recognition that comes with it impose us to do that otherwise we will always be level two level three level four type of properties and we cannot we cannot do that you know i think you have to be flexible in in, in your flexibility is lacking because there's like it's too traditional certain things have to be a certain way and not the other and i compare it to coaching because a lot of coaches are are not a lot but some coaches you see are more willing to experiment and think outside the box and do certain things that are like out of the ordinary, there's some ATO someplace, some that that others are afraid to, to try because it's unconventional. Because players will question it's like, oh, this we've never done this before. We only had it this way and not the other way. So let's keep on doing it the same way. And there's there's in certain cultures, there's some of that mentality still left. And I think the the ones that are going to be able to think outside the box, not only on the court, but also off the court, they will be the ones that will be succeeding going forward. I mean, man, I said Look at what Jalgiris has been able to do. Yeah. Jalgiris took, and credit to Polius Motoyunas uh, for that, right? And the work he has done in the last years, took the relevance of that sports property and armed this organization with top level tools to make it at the level of, I mean, an NBA franchise to a certain past. Like the doublers of, the, of, of Jalgiris, what, the, the, the <laughs> B team, what? Where do they practice? I've been in that gym. Like yeah, it's yeah. better than it's better than twenty, probably seventy-five percent of the practice facilities of, of Euroleague teams elsewhere. Right? Mm -hmm. That comes from the fact that basketball in Lithuania has been a driver of culture, a driver of independence, a driver of the identity. Mm -hmm. But then you also have to just not be there and rest on your successes. Which, and I'm 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 kind of. A, um, knocking on, 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 on myself, on my own people, like that's a little bit what we've done in Italy, right? Like in the, in the 80s and the 90s, we have the resources, we, we, we had the champions, we had the, the brands, and we were not able to plug in the sports marketing culture into something while in other places that was happening. In Spain, Real Madrid and Barcelona have driven the sports marketing um, market for everybody else, starting from football, of course, but then applying to basketball. And there's so, so many opportunities there in that space because they understood that if they wanted to compete, you know, with other countries who at the time had more resources, like for example, Italy, they had to just better their product. Mm -hmm. If you are Jagris and you want to compete to, uh, with Barcelona or uh, with uh, Maccabi, you got to be at top of your game and you got to give a great experience to your fans and um, and I think I think uh, uh, I think in the end you need leaders, right? Uh, I think in America there is this culture of empowering leaders and also knocking them off when they when things yeah. don't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like this, syndrome, right? But this it's this leader um, centric type of mentality that empowers somebody to affect change. In Europe, we are always questioning. We are always jealous. We are always dismantling the success of somebody else. But well, maybe that's what we need right now. We need somebody that is able to guide us 
you know, through change, because that's what we have to face. Innovation, innovation and, and, and innovative mentality. And that's what I meant was tall poppy syndrome. I don't know if you heard the expression where poppies grow and they're kept in a certain alignment. And there's one that, that grows a little bit higher, looks different and gets chopped off right away. So it's even with everybody else. And in Europe, we have this tall poppy syndrome in, in some cultures more than the others where you people are afraid to stand out and people are afraid to be different. So everybody is trying to blend in and do it in their little bit in their own kind of ways, but not to stand out too much so, so you don't get criticized because you make yourself vulnerable. That's the same thing I can speak from a personal experience, from a personality aspect, because when, you're out, when you are different, when you are out, out, outgoing, you are outspoken in certain, in certain settings, maybe it's not the, the norm, but you also make yourself vulnerable. You make yourself attack if, if, you, if you are, if you say things that are uncalled for, obviously, but sometimes you're also trying to be creative. You are, you are, I see things in color. Some people see things in black and white, but I prefer, I prefer to live in, in, in color and have a, have a little bit more of a different mindset and see that's where the nuances come in. And everywhere, especially in sports, you have so many nuances where you have to see things in color and cannot see in black and white. I agree with you. Yeah. Um, so moving on, before we go my ATOs, I have one more, one more question I wanted to dig in with you uh, about uh, EuroLeague and uh, uh, NBA in regards to Euroleague and FIBA calendar wise, um, how, in your opinion, is it, are, would they be able to solve this calendar problem? Because it's over, obviously an overload of um, um, players uh, going on in, in many regards. And to balance all this out and not losing the quality of the product, especially in Euroleague, um, because it's so crunched together, and then you have the FIBA when FIBA windows on top of that. It's yeah. it's, a, it's a lot of lot of confusion and a lot of um, complicated uh, issues. How, what's what's your um, answer for that? I think I think you really has been trying a different model. Um, I think clubs now have a certain number of years, for sure impacted by COVID, where they can make their own evaluation of a greater ask to clubs and players, right? In terms of the amount of games, in terms of this format that, that was chosen, mm -hmm. what is the feedback from their stakeholders? What are clubs saying? What are players saying? Now there's ELPA that can provide that type of feedback, the only players association. And what, from a revenue perspective, what has that generated? And from a product perspective, what has the fans, which is the other stakeholders, sometimes we tend to forget in Europe, what, what are they, what, what feedback are they giving? I think we are at that point where inevitably um, Euroleague, we need to make an evaluation about that. And in the end, who's Euroleague are the clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope, I hope that they'll find, uh, you know, alignment mm -hmm. uh, and they will have this conversation. Um, I think a solution needs to be found. Everybody is unhappy right now. Yeah. I understand that there are all time uh, positions and all time frictions, and it's tough to fix those things. Um, so I'm not saying that it's not gonna require a lot of work, uh, but I think the pandemic is, is somehow pushing all of us to reevaluate certain things because at the personal level, uh, as stakeholders in this world, and uh, it's time for those entities to actually uh, find an alignment for the betterment of the sport. Because I go back to this uh, polarized sports world. The NBA is up there. Like you are, and when I say you, I mean European basketball, uh, a product that needs to find his own niche. And that comes from determine your identity, better your product and make sure that you have the revenue to be sustainable. Uh, and you can do that only if you are a responsible part of a greater ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's time I think it's time to fix it. Uh, I know the com com conversations are ongoing um, and uh, hopefully, hopefully all the stakeholders will be able to to find again an aligned position it's a lot of different interests and uh, di different interests needs to be represented in the right way and i think that's there's a lot of um complicated issues that i can probably uh, name all but um that it's at the at the benefit of at the cost of players you cannot have 
this calendar just chaotic because it's going to end up in, in injuries, it's going to end up in lo loss of quality, it's going to end up in, in also fans not really seeing what they need to see uh, in terms of in terms of that. So the satisfaction on too many levels. Benas, let's go. Let's jump back for a second to your question about the different cultures, right? Sports cultures. Um, the U.S. sports culture is about stakeholders, stakeholders management. That's the greatest quality of the current commissioner and of the league office in general. Um, I think in Europe, we either give ourselves the opportunity to acknowledge the different stakeholders and so listen to them, um, interact with them, recognize them, or if we keep going top bottom in terms of approach, we're always going to have an unbalanced system mm -hmm. because you need to find, again, balance among all the different uh, entities that are part of this game. And that happens only if you start to talk to everybody. Mm -hmm. While historically, sports in Europe, and this applies to football, and it's the result of, uh, uh, you know, of now I tell you how things are going to look like. And who is the strongest in that moment is going to impose to the other stakeholders how it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. That's not how today's sports can work. I agree. I agree. You ready to hear my ATOs? ATOs. You ready? I'm ready. All right. We'll see. We'll see if you're ready. <laughs> I hope I study. <laughs> um, there's one I, I thought of that, and I will not debate or not 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 uh, go into into uh, back and forth about that. You just I just want to hear your opinion and maybe have a little uh, point about it. But this is, I start with a weird one. Uh, what's the possibility of an NBA game in Antarctica? Ooh. We should ask Adam about that. Um, that's a, that's a great idea. Yeah, I know. Let's I know. Let, let, you heard it here first. Okay, okay, guys. Ben, pass, pass, pass it along. Okay, okay, we will. We will. I would say we have 30% of a game in Arctica before uh, 2036. Okay. All right. Um, best Twitter follow, non-basketball. Non-basketball? Yeah. Anything geopolitical nowadays, unfortunately. Geopolitical. Mm-hmm. Best personal investment you've made in the past? Putting gas in my car to go watch uh, under 15 regional games when I was 17, 18. Um, just invest, just investing, investing in uh, in my passion. I would say. I, you know, why I was laughing. I was going to laugh because he said putting gas in my car before the prices went up. <laughs> no, today, today probably I couldn't afford it. Luckily, at that time. We were not during a during a, a commodity crisis like we are today. Yeah. Uh, favorite business book that you recommend or, or or give to other people? Think fast, think slow. Um, one skill you wish you had. Um, ooh, tough. I have so many <laughs> that I would like to have. <laughs> um, probably the ability of um, that magical ability of certain leaders to be very synthetic. What do you mean? Synthetic doesn't make sense now because synthetic in English is a different thing. I'm translating from Italian. See, mm -hmm. um, synthesis though. Yeah, synthesis. Yes. Synthesis from certain leaders. Being a, being able to being able to convey a message in the least amount of words. Gotcha. Which which, which leader? clearly by this by by this podcast you understood it's uh, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the the main message is uh, identity. Um, and that was the main that was that was one of the main topics today. So I guess that was the to synthesize it into one word. Oh, for sure, that has been my obsession in the last in the last few years, for sure. I'm with you on that one. And last one, um, number one advice you would give to a European prospect uh, coming up: understand what are the resources around you. You will need to use them. Maybe not today. Don't shy away from understanding who can do what for you down the road. On the court and off the court. Bravissimo. 
Finito, Matteo. Finito. You made you made it. We we played the game without the controllers, but we were the controllers ourselves. Our mouth were the controllers, and um, I enjoyed it a lot. It was really great. It was, thanks for having me here. Thank you. Thanks for 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 this awesome location. Yeah, and it's a first. It's a first. Uh, so, thanks for that. When you're in town with your next guest, maybe you can come back. Now I'll show you. I'll show you the court. Maybe Patty's still shooting. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. You said it. I will be, I'll be back. I'll be back. And uh, thanks, everybody, for watching um, in this great venue. Bye.